Greetings, and welcome to Revenant Den. I'm Michael Hassenfang, and this is Episode 9, The Blending for the Unification of the Bride. And I'm starting this video a little late. Uh, I have a very, very dry throat today. Um, Boise is not the best weather for me. <laughs> so I'm kind of going to be coughing a lot. And the heavy breathing that you guys hear from me doing is not because I'm like, you know, 300 pounds or anything like that, as you can see. I'm, I mean, I've got a little bit of a beer gut there, but um, it, it's not like I'm, you know, sitting there with a, you know, gulp-sized giant thing of cola in my hand and a pizza and just... <sighs> <sighs> it's just, it has to do with my throat. Um, I smoke clove cigarettes in my 20s. And for those of you who know clove cigarettes know the issue with them back when they had fiberglass in the filters. And my throat is always scratchy now. And it's perpetually dry. And you'll see me doing gestures like that where I'm like trying to breathe or I'm coughing. Um, it, it has to do with that. It has to do with just my throat being torn up. I still do, as you can see, uh, pipe tobacco and cigars and stuff like that but to me that's different because it's it's not cigarettes I'm totally against cigarettes for any of you smoking cigarettes you should stop because it's not good for you it's full of nicotine and other chemicals and you put that into your lungs and the difference between that and like cigars and pipe tobacco is that you don't inhale it I mean you could inhale it if you want to throw up but it's it's made for an aromatic you know you just you put it in you roll it out of your mouth and you blow it out and it's supposed to smell nice and wonderful and some people don't like the smell of cigars um i'm kind of one of those guys that sort of teeter on it uh, i prefer pipe tobacco smell i like smoking cigars but i prefer the smell of pipe tobacco um but yeah you don't you don't put that in your throat you don't put it in your lungs or anything like that <coughs> as you can see the cough that i have is from my, my cigarette days, which I haven't smoked in probably 30 years. Um, very dried out. So in the past videos you watch me, you see me kind of struggling with my throat or breathing heavy or coughing. It's it's due to that. And it's due to the aridness of this place. I like a little bit more cool, but humid weather, kind of like that misty London fog stuff. You'll probably never hear me cough as much and stuff like that. So... For those who are kind of curious why I'm constantly talking weird or raspy voice or dryness or coughing, it's it's because of that. So, and and today is a bad day. So before we jump into it, I just wanted to apologize for that because you'll probably hear that a lot, or maybe I'll try and cut it out. You'll just see a lot of cuts happening in the video probably from that. So now you know what that is. Um, we're going into the topic of the blending of the church, and this is a topic that both thrills me. Uh, but also kind of, I don't want to say scares me, but just it's, it makes me feel kind of uncomfortable because it is also sort of a battle of the flesh. At least right now it is because of the dark days that are ahead of us and the things that the Lord is calling us, us to do, which even a couple of years ago, I probably would have laughed in your face and said, that's just nonsense. But after all the prophetic words I've been hearing from so many people and all these prophetic words coming true and the different things that I've been hearing about healing stories and uh, the the with the anointing of oil with people like Manuel Johnson and Don Rigney and Julie Green, where they go and they anoint these large crowds of people with one bottle of like holy oil and the and the oil just whoop, just rises right up and stuff like that. I go into the story of that with the um the uh, anointing episode that I had a few few chapters back. Um, just so many things, so many visions of what is to come and what the church is being unified into. Uh, it, it, it does kind of, <clears throat> it does kind of freak me out a little bit because um, it, it's just, I, I have this, like, there's, I feel a calling on all of us that God is asking us to do. And it's fighting so hard against our flesh and so hard against what we are looking for. And the more I press into this and the more I pray into this and the more I try and give up to the Lord, which is on a constant daily struggle with me, the more that I see that he's trying to use my pain and suffering. Um, and I'm not trying to say that in a in a bad way, like, give me your pain and suffering so so I can do something. But he wants to take our pain and suffering and turn it into something precious, into something wonderful for his glory so that he can get all the praise and worship um, from our struggles, our lost trials and tribulations. And it is hard for me because I, I have a very 
bad trust issue with God. Um, again, if you go back to the episode of They Will Catch Up, you will see where my struggles lie. And I'm trying to explain this to you in a sense that the reason I'm doing these videos is because I know many of you out there are in the same boat. You understand what is going on. You're watching the prophets. You're listening to all this stuff that is happening. You you can almost foretell and foresee prophetically what is going to be happening. And you know how uh, the White Hats and the government, the military, certain people are in this sting operation as well to turn over uh, everything in this nation and qu quite possibly pretty much the whole world um, but they're also but the Lord is also in on it as well too and there's a lot of work which needs to be done um, and it, it, it's it's hard for us because from a few years ago we had a different agenda we were doing different things we had different callings and th though some of those callings may have been from the lord there's been an alteration in things we many of us have been put on this pioneer or path setting or just <clears throat> solitude this wilderness season the cave dwelling season where we're alone and we're being prepped for this time which is going to be coming in very soon like all the prophets i mean now's the time this we've entered uh, 5784 and it's the open door season it's the open door year where things are going to start turning on its head but in order for that to happen a lot of the bad is going to need to be exposed in an exponential sense to wake up everyone else who is asleep or people even in the church who might not be aware or awake to what is going on or don't believe it all the way down to the most harsh atheist that just is just taking pictures and selfies of their food and their dogs and their bike rides and are just completely oblivious to everything that is going on right now there's there's been a big change in this season and our callings seem to have been uh stopped and whatever we were doing, whether it was secular or even for the church or for anything else, a lot of us have been like halted and God has moved us into a different position into this warring and battle season. And it's been just, uh, to be quite blunt, hellish. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, pardon the pun, but it's, it's been that. And we've, we've been suffering, we've been in pain and every day of my life, just every minute eternal second of living these past couple years have just been just just nothing but pain and at the same time i've also been growing in the lord as well too he's been prepping us and getting us ready for what is to come to lead all the other people who are going to be pretty much shocked awake at what's going to be happening and um it's it's not easy because there has been many people who have been talking about what's going to be happening with the church, how it's going to be changing. It's not going to be the same old Sunday, you know, one hour church as usual. This is going to be world life altering, changing stuff. And it is kind of scary for me because it, it, it ups the ante. If you ever notice in the Old Testament, you know, God lays down the Mosaic law. He puts on the law, sorry, do this, do that. You know, he, he um, even with just some of the the laws of Moses gave him like 600 something laws and then to top it off he gave him the 10 commandments Jesus comes <clears throat> he comes to fulfill the law but not only does he fulfill the law he ups the ante you know he uh says you know it it, it is written that it is uh, forbidden for a man to sleep with another man's wife you know or like to commit adultery but i say unto you if you even look at a woman and lust after her you have sinned so now he's taken the law and he went now i'm going to put this giant hulking elephant on top of it and there's many of us uh <clears throat> it wasn't john Haggy, it was it was someone else who, who quoted book well that's that's just impossible and the lord told him yeah that's the point he's like i'm giving you these laws to show you not just how sinful you are but how holy i am and you will never attain these laws you know when you're sitting at a a bar well i know some of you don't drink i i have a beer occasionally or a glass of wine Let, let's say you're sitting uh you know just uh, in a subway station you know and a cute woman walks by or something and you try not to you know you try and invert the eyes because you don't want to sit there and, and, and lust is just <laughs> it's like it seems like a daily struggle for some of you people out there um and it, it just it seems like almost an impossibility you know it's like that can't be attained 
And, and Jesus was pretty much trying to emphasize, yeah, that's, that's why I said it. It can't be attained. It shows you exactly just how far way, way above in his righteousness and goodness and, and just, just absolute purity that God is compared to how we are in just this earthly, fleshly, you know, just, uh, train wreck of a human being we are where we, we can't even get past just that by any detail and i'm sure if he wanted to he could up the ante out a whole bunch of stuff if you listen to the sermon on the mount he kind of does that and he does that in other certain parables as well too but i'm sure his his uh upping the ante is is just it's it's eternal you know he, he could put that elephant on and then if we try to achieve that he's like okay now i'm gonna put this elephant on top of that elephant we're just gonna keep stacking them just to show you how absolutely off the charts, you know, I am compared to the sinful nature of man is. And I think we're going to be seeing that with this turning of the church, with the turning of the tides, the flipping of the tables, the stuff that God is calling us to be. He's upping the ante yet again on explaining and showing and pushing us forward into who the church actually is and what we're supposed to be. And I also delved into this just even uh, just a peppercorn speck in the previous episode or so about the kings and priests of who we are, you know, being spiritual warriors, of being soldiers, of being ambassadors to Christ, of being uh, the, the bride of Christ. I mean, there's, there's a whole litany of stuff that even we are that God is trying to tell us, you know, and show us during this time who we're supposed to be and how we're supposed to stand and how the gates of hell will not prevail against us. And a lot of us just <clears throat> think an hour or so on Sunday and, and praying, you know, here and there to make sure the day goes well uh, is what the bride of Christ is. And it's like, you, you guys are just, you're, you're so underscoring it. Let me put this elephant on top of what the Bible says to, you know, now emphasize who you're supposed to be. And I think he's doing that right now. The Lord is upping the ante and explaining exactly what the church is supposed to be and what we'll be heading into after this dark season has passed, after those who are trying to take over the world are trying to push in the tribulation preemptively. Um, and it's not going to happen. There's wars and rumors of wars, and it turns out that things are going to escalate at least from what I've seen and from what I'm hearing people say, I mean, it's it's going to go to, you know, code red, <laughs> you know, pretty much level five code red um, <clears throat> pretty soon here. And whether the Lord is going to stop that or we actually, you know, finally agree with him to stop it uh, with him during that time, I have, I have no idea how he's going to do it. I know the glory is going to go to him. I know that whatever he does or whatever he asks us to do with him during this time to be in agreement to stop it is that it is most definitely and most assuredly going to be a God thing. Like no one is going to be walking away from this saying, oh, that was man. Job well done, guys. You know, the military did it. You know, they will be part of it. Trump will be part of it. Politicians will be part of it. You, the church, will be part of it. People who are starting to wake up will be part of it. But we're only in part of that. God will take all the glory from this. And I think some of the things that we will be seeing during this time, during this new church era of just standing bold in who we are to be and just the gifts and the prosperity that is going to be coming from it, as it says on earth as it is in heaven, where he's trying to show us exactly what he wanted the world to be. And the crashing down of this Babylonian system is going to be coming. And from that, from the ashes of everything that's just going to be totally wiped out and annihilated from political agendas to governmental buildings to even our own currency, it's, it's going to be wiped out. Get ready for that. I, I'm not saying, I don't know what to say to that. I don't know how to say you know, what you should prep for, what you should um, collect, what you should take in for money, what you should get ready during these times. I don't know. All I can say is listen to the Lord on that. Take his advice and follow through with it to what he wants you to do. I have my own thing. I, I think I'm somewhat set. There's probably a few more things I could do. Um, but for the most part, I've been trying to listen here and there to the little jabs he's been giving me on what to do. And I've been trying to follow through with that. To the best of my ability. <clears throat>
But once all that finally goes down from those ashes of everything that has been leveled, we will finally see and be building up into this new era of what the church and what the whole planetary system should be under God. And you will see the billion soul harvest as part of that. But the darkness, again, needs to come first so that we can jar these people awake. We can level down all the evil that is happening. They think it's for their agenda, but God has, again, the trap, which is going to close on them, and it'll backfire on them, blow back in their faces. We need to be part of this. We need to agree with it. We need to start battling and gearing up and getting ready for everything that's going to be happening. And then we will see a prosperity, which I don't think any of us can even comprehend what that's going to be, but I have some ideas of what I think it may be, and even then, I think it's not even skimming the surface, just the tip of the iceberg of what it's going to be. And I'll get into that right now. But first, we're going to do that. Get past the introduction here of just my constant ramblings, because that's what I do on a perpetual basis. Isn't that fun? Maybe I should open it. That might help. Try and shoot it through the aluminum foil. Again, I'm, I'm posting up communion wafers and the juice for uh, in the link for those who don't have any and would like to partake in communion, either with this video or just in your own household to give to your families and stuff like that, or, or for, with yourself. Or um, I know sometimes it's hard for some of us to make it to church, and we would like to commune. I do it every day newer uh not newer uh future <laughs> sorry videos i'll be getting into that too about the communion but right now we will dive into the idea of what may be coming with the church and the blending and unification of it <clears throat> and some things which may also be falling away we got to be prepared for that as well too so and take to heart why it may be falling away so Heavenly Father, please help me today to speak to somebody out there, hopefully many, but if I can even reach just one, that would be great, about turning and awakening to what is going on today so that they may be prepared and to be a partaker in agreement with you in the actions of what is happening and what your will is to bring in this new kingdom era. Hopefully my words will speak out and reach them in fact not even my words but your words please speak through me i know i just kind of ramble on and talk a bunch of nonsense <clears throat> but i hope i can at least reach one person out there who will be able to take this and from there they will be able to multiply more into your kingdom in jesus name i pray amen Daniel, when praying, always asks for the forgiveness of his sins first. So that, I believe, his prayers he felt would reach God. And I think maybe I should do that a little bit more. I think we all should when approaching the Father, ask for forgiveness first. So, Lord, forgive me for asking for forgiveness. <laughs> so, for any past sins that I may have had this week uh, since the last time of meeting, which are probably plenty, because I've been driving a lot this week. Um, yes, uh, always ask um, for any wrongdoings that you may have done, um, or even un unknowingly may have done. Uh, I think maybe your prayers would uh, be better well received as the sin is then removed and the cutting off is no longer there. So... <clears throat> Again, sorry for the constant coughing. So, but now that I've halfway through the series explained why I'm constantly coughing, that would probably be it. So, there was a time that there was a sickness going around, uh, supposedly COVID, but I don't, I don't know. Um, and kind of phlegmy throats, really scratchy coughs. Everyone had it, so even I had it for a while, as some of you may have seen from previous videos. So be on guard. My grandma just got it, and she's in South Carolina. Had to be put on an oxygen tank, um, which I don't know if I believe that. So, I mean, not that she wasn't put on on an oxygen. I'm just saying for healing purposes. I think there's there's a 
different agenda to that, as I'm sure most of you have known. If you're well aware of the stuff that I'm talking about, it's, yeah, it's a different rabbit trail I'll get into later, but further down in the series. So not really in today's episode. Today we're going to be talking about the church. My wife and I have uh, always dreamed of a particular church um, that wasn't so uh, mutually like exclusive from one another. They, they, they weren't so segregated. Um, now I'm not saying that uh, the Catholic Church becomes Pentecostal, you know, uh, starts speaking in tongues and dancing around and stuff like that, you know, where, where it's where it's all meshed together. But <clears throat> we always found it interesting um, to see all the good aspects of certain denominations and wondered what a church would be like if they could be unified together with those particular pros and the removal of the cons. Like you look at um, the creative majesty of say the Catholic church and what's called the visual word. Uh, everything's art. They build majestic cathedrals and murals and just the sculptures and the paintings and don't take the sculptures as a bad thing all right i'm talking when you exclude the adoration from it okay i don't believe in sitting worshiping statues and stuff but i do believe in creating art to tell the story of the bible um as a way of worship to god it's not just singing, but what you can do with your hands, with painting and sculpting and building and just, they took everything of that and just amped it up. And there's also a bit of um, mystery to the Catholic Church. There's, there's I, I don't want to say mysticism, though people like Chuck Missler would consider themselves a Christian mystic, if one understands the true definition of what a mystic is. And... <clears throat> There's sort of a, a I, I, I like a mystery of the ethereal, um, and I think the Catholic Church does that, but they also have their cons, too. You look at the adoration of the saints and praising to them, even though every Catholic will tell you, oh, it's not worship, we're just praying to them. It's like you're kissing their feet, okay? I don't, if, if you're communing with saints because there are some christians that believe that saints can look down from us from heaven watch what we're doing and intercess for us because god's up in heaven they're up in heaven and if they see our prayers they go and speak to god you know and help the intercession okay i get that you know you can go straight to god on that <clears throat> but if you're asking friends and family down here for help why not ask friends and family up there for help as well, too? Okay, I get it, but that's the extent of it, okay? You start kissing feet. I don't care where I am down here, how much trouble I'm in, what sort of scenario or life-altering situation that I'm in that is so dire that I need to ask for prayers from friends and family that I will go down and kiss their feet to do it. Okay, that's, that's not praying. That's not an intercession. That's you giving adoration and worship to somebody. And I don't agree with that, okay? You can make statues, you can do the visual word, you can make creations, you can have the splendor of art and majesty for God made you a created being to create, all right? Especially if it's for the glorification of him. And even, yes, the church that is with him, in agreement with him, or has worked for him, or he worked through them. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and you're just telling a story that's that's totally fine okay get it um but there's that there's and i'm just gonna wait on this till it's exposed but i'm pretty sure that i'm not lying when i say the dark secrets of the vatican that is located within their chambers and underneath vatican city and the whole litany of stuff that is being hidden underneath there i i 
I, I don't think that is just conspiracy theory small talk. I, I think there's a lot of stuff that the Vatican has done throughout the centuries that is being hidden away and will be exposed in the latter days. Now, does that mean that every Catholic isn't saved? No. I believe the majority of Catholics are saved. I believe that in their heart, they believe that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior, that he came down from heaven, was born of Virgin Mary, died and rose on the third day. As far as I'm concerned, you're in, okay? Other denominations believe that, and their own doctrines within their faith is what skews it and makes it screwed up. And I could go into a whole tangent, even with that, on communion. I'll do that at a late, later date, but just, just a little snippet of it is how people believe that the Eucharist is, you know, is just uh, symbolism. And with the Catholics, they believe in transubstantiation, which means that after you take it and drink it, it transforms into the literal body and blood of Christ. Now, I don't care what you believe in that, because I don't think that that is a uh, entry into heaven. All right, whatever your whatever your thoughts or ideologies are on certain aspects of the faith, apart from the core elements, like just the flat out. If you don't believe Jesus is Lord and Savior, you know, and he died uh, on the cross and rose on the third day and was born in Virgin Mary, just the fundamentals of that. Um, if you don't believe in that, then I got some questions on your faith. Apart from that, I think anything else is extra biblical. You know, there's, there's no really in-depth discussion on what is, you know, uh, right, what is wrong, what, what is the absolute truth on these bases? You know, some people drink, some people don't drink. I'm one of those people who drink and smoke. I'm a C.S. Lewis and J.R. Token fan, so I'm going to drink and smoke. It's part of the Christian faith for me that if you're not indulging too much uh, in overindulgences, you know, you know the difference between temperance and tolerance. You're not going to go out and binge drink every night. Yeah, I have a drink. I maybe have like a beer or two a week. I've been doing a little bit more this month because it's Oktoberfest, so I'm going out and having a little bit more festivities, but I'm not staggering to the car, throwing up everywhere, and you know, just belligerently blah, 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 you know, passing out somewhere. I don't believe in that. I believe in going out, having fun, um, trying not to over overdo it. Though in the past couple of years, five years, I may have overdid it like maybe once or twice, and that's because the wife wants to go out and do more tasters after I'm done. <laughs> so, but I know my cutoff, but she still wants to do some more. So that's always fun. Uh, that uh, I'm learning to know the absolute limits and when to cut myself off. So you could say the same thing for cheesecake. Um, you know, you, you eat the whole cake or you're just going to go in for a slice. Uh, you know, try not to overindulge too much. Know the limits, no temperance and tolerance. There's other faiths. Um, <clears throat> say like, oh, <laughs> sorry, I was going to make a joke about the Orthodox. Let me just bring it back in a little bit. OK, there's a, there's a Catholics with the visual word. Um, I like stuff like Orthodox chants, Orthodox singing. Uh, my wife, again, going back to visual world, but we both like Calvary, Calvary Chapel, where they go in and read the Bible when they have sermons. It's literally, we're going to go through the book, and they just continue through the book, verse by verse by verse by verse. I know that there's certain Bible studies. I go to one at my church, at, at an Azarene church, where we go and we study and we read it verse by verse and get into a discussion on that. Calvary Chapel does that with their actual sermons, at least the ones that I've been to. Maybe there might be some other Calvary Chapels that don't do that, but I know the formula for that is they just go through and just all the way through. And hopefully one of these decades, they actually plow through the entire Bible. But they go in depth. They talk about, um, you know, different definitions in Greek and in Hebrew and you know, some in Aramaic because that's, you know, some of the Bible's written in that as well. Um, I love the depth of Chuck Missler, who is a, a genius in the literal sense of the word, the actual, you know, gene, he is a genius, um, and was a code breaker and just goes into the Bible and just tears it apart. Like he, he is, he is amazing in his lecture series on just depicting the Bible and different topicals of the Bible. Um, 
what other pros you know stuff stuff like i don't know baptists uh, you you make good picnics <laughs> so i don't know like we're, we're we're just we're thinking of what are all the aspects of different pros and cons of different churches and you look at some of the best things that some of these churches have i know the church i go to right now at the the nazarene church um they're very big into fellowship and community with the bride of christ uh and the mission work that they do of spreading the gospel everywhere um you look at the Pentecostals and like their prime thing is, is just receiving the gifts of the spirit and speaking in tongues and trying to heal. And it's like you're taking all these different aspects of God, these different um, uh, pros within each denomination. And I'm like, what happens if you just sort of form all of those pros into one thing that is the church, that is the bride of Christ, that is just like nobody is so um divided from one another within our denominations that they keep pointing fingers at each other and saying well you're right about there you know you're wrong about this or this is this, this is good but we don't agree with you on that and it's just like all you do is you take the pros of each one and you just mix it together into the whole body <clears throat> and i feel that that's where we are heading once the tables flip though to be fair Again, I don't think I'm even skimming the surface of what's going to be happening. I think that's just, again, just the tip of the iceberg where where we finally see the pros of what each church is, realize that it is God sent. <clears throat> and even though that particular denomination of what you may be in may not do that as a fundamental thing, we have to do this, everyone do this now, you know, it's, they don't do that. They still stay within their, their denominations, but they accept what certain people who are coming in do because they understand that those are the gifts of the spirit side is a calling that God has been putting them into and it builds up the church to become stronger and more unified either within that building that congregation or in mass as the entire bread of Christ because the more we stop battling each other in the church and start being unified and understanding of all the gifts that everyone has the better and i think stronger and faster this will come to fruition with the turning of the tables because we need to be in agreement not just with god but with each other within the congregation within the bread of christ and i notice there's a lot of bickering and a lot of fighting and it's like well we don't believe in that it's like well, i don't care if you believe in that that's what God says we should do, and that's what I'm going to be doing, regardless what you believe. And that's not fighting with you. That's just saying, I'm putting God first and your congregation second. Because as much as some people think that we may need the church, we need God more. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and everything else will be added unto you. There was a question going around that I saw online. Uh, uh, I can't remember the link. It was it was one of those like NBC or CBC, you know, dot com. Just it, obviously, it was very secular. And the person writing it says um, Jesus is not a personal God, you know. And it's like it's 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 not. There's no personal relationship with God. <laughs> it's just like that is the most that is the most bizarre thing I have ever heard in my life. He's your Lord and Savior. He's your groom. He is, you know, just everything in your life, but there's nothing personal about it. That makes no sense whatsoever. You know, with the, the congregation, the whole bride of Christ is all of us down here, and we're supposed to act and help out each other and to show the love of Christ. But you don't, it's not, it's not a Jesus and thing. <clears throat> You know, it's, uh, it's another thing, a uh, con with the Catholic faith is that they have like the sales of indulgences. You know, you, you can be saved if you pay this amount for your sin or it's, or it's always Jesus and this. So you need to be baptized or you need to do this or you need to do that. It's Jesus and Jesus and Jesus and it's not just Jesus. There's a lot of people going around these days that are thinking it's Jesus and the congregation or Jesus and the body of Christ. No, no, it's not Jesus and anything. It's just Jesus period, straight up, flat out, nothing else. You cannot substitute the church in place of Christ. Yes, he is your Lord and Savior. He's also your groom. And as a body of Christ, this is a personal relationship we have with him. But it's also 
as the body of Christ as well, too, and the fellowship we have with each other in relation to him. See, it's in relation to Christ. If we didn't have Christ and we were just, uh, we'd, we'd just be a social club, I might as well go and join a, a golf course and socialize with them and fellowship with them. It's because of Christ that we have this body that we can be tuned in to him and for him. That we, that we were made for him, for his enjoyment, for his purpose, not our purpose or what we think the congregation's purpose should be in regards to him. If I have a calling that's from him, that's being set apart for a while from the church, I'm going with what God said, not with what the church says, because he's calling me to do something, not you. And there's many people that say, you know, that, how do I explain this? And, and I'm trying not to do it in a way that's, that's downgrading or belittling or mean or anything like that. But if I gave up my spouse, my children, my parents, my brother, my sister, all the deepest friendships that I have, the closest relationships that I have, as the Bible says, you need to give all these up and love God solely. <clears throat> That if you think the church is going to replace those people, I got a newsflash for you, all right? Don't think so highly of yourself. That's never going to happen, ever. What ever is that going to happen? You think that these people are going to replace my children? No. Now, I'm not saying that to demean you or downgrade the purpose of the church, but I'm saying that to not downgrade those of who I love and care about, okay? If I'm giving up them, the people who I love and sincerely cherish and admire and adore for Christ, no one's going to replace that but Christ. End of story. This is not up for discussion. No one's going to replace that. The only person who's going to substitute and fill that loss is Christ. From that, then you will receive a multitude of family members. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and everything else will be added unto you. This includes the body of Christ. And for me, the addition of the family a hundredfold in the body of Christ is an added unto. It's not a replacement of. You cannot replace the person that I've lost in my life. You can be added in addition to them, but the only person that's being replaced in that spot or is open for is Jesus or, you know, the guidance of the Holy Spirit or the word of the Father. No one else gets to have that place. It's not for you and it never was. I think when Job lost his original family, all his sons and daughters, and grieved them, but in the end, God replenished him with an abundance of new family members. They didn't replace the old people, his old sons and daughters. I'm sure he suffered the loss of them exponentially throughout his entire life and died in pain, you know, like suffering at the thought that they were out of his life. And now they are unified with him in heaven. But... The people that were added unto him, his new, I was going to say siblings, sorry, his new children was in addition to what he had lost. He is now prosperous with a whole multitude of siblings. God, I said it again, a whole multitude of children. Um, but they were never replaced. Uh, they were just in addition to, and this is how I see the body of Christ. Those lost, everything else will be added unto you. You know, anyone that has lost, a, you know, a spouse or children or parents or any loved ones, any friends, will get a hundredfold in a kingdom to come. That's great. That is awesome. And, and I'm happy for it. I'm glad I'm part of a church where you all are all brothers and sisters in Christ. And we are unified in Jesus and we'll be together forever and having fun throughout all of eternity. As Kak here said, heaven is half fun and half worship. You know, the fun part is, is having time together with the Lord and all the brothers and sisters of Christ, the whole family. And the second is worship of God. But the only person that is replacing that loss 
at least now, is God. None of you can replace that. The people I care about in my life that I've lost, um, it, that's that's just that's just not happening. Uh, my love for them is goes beyond is is it's just it's a personal love that I have for them, which which can't be replaced at all, no matter who thinks they could step in apart from Jesus. He's the only one that can fix it. The Holy Spirit is the only one that can give us counsel on our grievances. And the Word of God um, helps us with the counseling as well, too. Uh, and we just need to realize that as part of the body of Christ, that we are unified in His holy family, in this eternal family, in this heavenly family that we're in. But there's loss which cannot be replaced no matter what type of friendship or what type of family you think you are in the bread of Christ. It's just, it just can't be replaced. I'm sorry to say it. I'm not trying to sound mean saying it that way. I'm just saying that you have a different place in my heart than those I've lost. And there's nothing that's going to replace that apart from Jesus. So that saying, Jesus is all you need, yeah, I believe that. Because what if I lost you? What if there's other people in this world that we have lost touch with? Whether we get to heaven and realize that some of these people that we loved and cared for aren't with us anymore. Can you truly say that Jesus is all you need? Uh, I hope so. Otherwise, you're going to be going through heaven pretty depressed. Um, it is a blessing to have the church. And it's a privilege to be part of the church. And I'm glad I'm part of the church. I'm glad I'm part of the body of Christ. I'm glad we have this unity and I'm glad we have this fellowship. And I'm glad we can work together to build up and glorify God. But we're part of a body of Christ for God, not for us, not for our unification so that we can all get to heaven and just still blow off God. He is supposed to be our everything. We're supposed to give up everything for Jesus. That includes people of the church. We need to give up everything for him. And from that, everything will be added unto us, including the body of Christ, including the fellowship we have with the church. Got to get that down pat. You got to realize that. You, no one else, is substitute for Jesus. I'm not saying that for him as just Lord and Savior. I, I'm saying that because he is our groom. The church is not my groom. Jesus is. I'm part of the church, but I live for him and not for anyone else. If we help out the church and we have fellowship with the church and we all get to heaven together, great. I'm looking forward to it, but he should be first and foremost. And we need to start realizing that as well, too. I want to make this exponentially clear. Christ is the only thing we need. If the church goes full Laodicea and falls away and you are the only person left standing, you're standing because of Christ, not because of the church. The church didn't save me. Christ saved me. I was not saved by the church. I came to Christ because of the evil that I saw in the world, not the good. If you listen to my monster mashing stories, that's just, that's just a smidgen of stories that I have of full supernatural evil demonic entity tales that I I, I can give a, a whole book full of that stuff both of dreams visions and real life encounters that I had <clears throat> and my mentality was if there's this much evil in the world if there is demonic entities then there has to be angels because what are demons are fallen angels and if there's angels then there's a God this is how I came to Christ I did not come to Christ because I was saved, because somebody led me to Christ. I came to Christ first, and from that, I started learning different people. There's a really, God, a really tall, huge, I mean, slender, slim Jim of a, of a guy named John. Uh, he was a roommate of my friend Sidney. Uh, like, like, I'm talking probably almost like seven feet tall. This, this dude was monstrously tall and slim and goth, and he, he was... He was pretty cool, but he was the nicest guy you would ever meet. He introduced me to Kent Hovind um, back in 2005, I believe. It was after I lived in San Francisco um, and came back. <clears throat> and I bumped into Sydney online, and he had me come and stay with him down in Madison, Wisconsin. 
and John was one of his roommates, and he was a Christian, full-blown goth, uh, but Christian, uh, which I thought was kind of cool and, and interesting at the same time because you, you never saw those two combined. At least I did back, back in those days. It wasn't wasn't really all there. It's like if, if you were goth, you were just, I mean, do I need to explain that? Um, <clears throat> and from that, I, <clears throat> excuse me again, Dranus, I got into Ken Hoven watching Creation Science Evangelism where he actually goes and teaches creationism from a scientific perspective and totally just debunks evolution. It was great. And then after that, I started jumping into people like uh, Chuck Smith and Chuck Missler. And then I got big into Mark Driscoll when he was still with Mars Hill Church in Seattle. He's down in Arizona now. Uh, Phoenix? Yes. With a with new church. So God bless him on that because he had a falling through with that church. And it looked like Satan won for a while. But now he's doing great and is reaching millions of people. But... It was from my own discernment of understanding what evil was that I came to goodness. And from that, I started to learn and started to read the Bible myself. My grandfather was part of the Gideons, and I believe I, I got a Gideon's book from him. And I, I never touched it forever until I started living in Madison. After me meeting John and doing Ken Hoven, I started flipping through Gideon's uh, while I was taking bus rides to work. And I would read that every day. It was, it was great. Um, that's what brought me into the into the congregation, into the bride of Christ, um, into servitude of the Lord and, you know, realizing that he is my Lord and savior. Um, but the church helped me. They helped me grow. They helped me, you know, get a whole bunch of viewpoints and like see the different ways that the church worships because I've bounced around so much throughout my life, been to so many different churches and it's, and it's great to see how each one does it. Um, and to fellowship with them and to be part of the body and to help them out and to be unified as the bride of Christ. But it's no substitute for Christ, right? Stop thinking that. Don't never, ever think that. Christ is your Lord and Savior. The bride is not your Lord and Savior. He's the one that gives you the gifts. He's the one that gives you the calling. He's the one that gives you the 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 privilege to be part of this body to help and bring in others into the body and grow it exponentially and to go out into the world and and preach and and show you know love and kindness to to all but you're showing love and kindness for him and him through you but not because of the church per se the church helps as part of the as part of the body you're you're you know you go and you help the bride of christ you go and and are unified through them and many miraculous things are done with the body and much fellowship is done much love but um if the church falls away i'm still with christ regardless uh, there's there's no substitute for that and once we realize this, and once we realize who we are in him, not who we are in the church, but who we are as the bride of Christ through him and for him, that's when we see the gifts starting to manifest. That's when we see more of the turning of the tables happening and more of these privileges being bestowed upon us and more of the recompense and restoration and revival that's going to happen through us for him, for his glory, not our glory. <clears throat> and there will be, and I, I hate to say prosperity, because when I say that, people think of the prosperity gospel, and that's that's not the route I'm trying to go. But at the same time, I kind of am, because God wants us to be prosperous. He He wants us to take what was what you know the what was given in the earth here and use it for His glory. Um, and I think a lot of us have this uh, have this uh, humble mentality of thinking that we just need to be eternally poor. <clears throat> well, how can you spread the gospel? How can you build up this this earth into what He wants? You know, on earth as it is in heaven, the prosperity, the the, the glory of God. If all of us are living in the mud, groveling in the dirt, while everyone who is evil gets all the gold, all the prosperity, and just takes over every single mountain of society. All of them have been taken over by Satan. And 
we think that's a good thing, or we think we shouldn't be there, or God isn't putting us in place of those things. It's like, <clears throat> well, one of those mountains of society is religious. Are, are you saying that God doesn't want you to be in the in, in, in the mountain of religion promoting Christ? Um, what about television? You know, is it going to be nothing but smut films all the time? What about the government, which I just got into in the last episode? You know, you're just going to let them stampede all over you without voting in the right people, without speaking out your mind of what this country should be and how it should be ruled and how it should be governed. You're just going to let them, ah, just let them have abortion, just kill whoever they want. Oh, let's let's have this this COVID epidemic fall upon us, you know, from other countries and sabotage the entire nation and have a flood of people coming in, you know, at the at the southern border and just just taking over this land through an invasion. It's just I'm just a, I don't pay attention to any of that. I just follow Jesus. It's like it looks like you're kind of not following Jesus. It looks like you're just kind of just sitting by, just allowing everything to happen and not being part of the body of Christ. We need to jump into it. We need to start being active. We need to start praying more. We need to start declaring and decreeing more. We need to start being in agreement for what God is calling us to do. We need to start taking action in the seven pillars of society. We need to start taking back that. We, we can't we can't just keep letting them walk all over us like we're just like Christians are nothing but a, a, a doormat. You know, we need to start taking action on all this. And once we do that, we're going to see the bride come back. We're going to see the church come back stronger, more unified, more built up, more strengthened, more emboldened to which the gates of hell will not prevail against us. And again, it's not through our strength. It's through God's strength. But we need to start asking for his strength. We need to start asking for his discernment, his power, his glory to fall upon us so we could start acting as a church, as his help meet, as his helper, as his bride. That's the whole point of a bride is to be his helper, not just telling people about him, but being his helper, acting upon that. And from that, we will see a growth and explosion within this nation and across the world. That's going to be just exponential. There's going to be prosperity returned to us. Just imagine for a second, <clears throat> if the tables flipped and everyone who is evil, all these trillion and gazillionaires that are hoarding and storing all this gold, all this money, all this wealth, everything that is taken from us, and it's given back to the people of God. I'm not saying millions. I'm saying trillions upon trillions upon trillions across the globe. Imagine if we went back to a gold standard and the trillions upon trillions upon trillions was given back to us in a backed gold standard. Could you imagine what type of world we could build from that the inventions the, the the cures which i think many i think there's many cures. i think there's a cure for cancer already i think there's a cure for aids i think there's a cure for pretty much every disease under the sun and it's being hidden from us because you know pharmaceuticals the easiest way to say it i mean they're not going to make money off healed people i i honestly think there's cures for practically everything under the sun and they're being hidden from us i think there's prosperity that can circle around this globe a thousand times over for everyone and it's being taken from us <clears throat> it's being hoarded away by those in power the the global elites and it's not just here in the united states it is it's called the global elites for a reason and i went into that uh the last episode actually when giving you the hint of saying people like Putin and Xi Jinping, I know I'm saying his name wrong, sorry, but um, you know, just just different world leaders who follow Trump. If you watch that video, The Greatest Show on Earth, I, th I think they're part of this. I think they're wanting their own global elite who are in control of their nation. Not really them, but they're they're the ones pulling the reins. And I think they want them out of their own countries. And I think once that happens, we're going to see different faces of different leaders pop up or maybe the same leaders, but a different demeanor to them to where they're going to be for Christ. Um, and they're going to be part of this new revival that's going to happen uh, and build up those creations and expose all those um, types of medicine or cures that have been hidden. It's going to be a new, new, a completely new way of life. <clears throat> There's people like Cat Care who said she, she saw just a glimpses of the stuff that's going to be coming. There's things where we're going to cure diseases with a form of light. There's going to be different means of travel. Um, 
the ocean is going to give up its hidden treasures. I've heard this from a lot of prophets, a lot of times. Something about the oceans is going to be revealed in the depths of the ocean. Something is going to happen where, I don't know if it's, if it's a form of currency or if it's a form of particular type of gas or means that we can use for travel. Um, something that has been hidden from the global elite that God has hidden away. And many of prophets said this, that God is purposely hiding right now will be exposed in these latter days and it's just it's going to change everything like our our way of life is just going to be flipped on its head for good um but right now it's we got to go through all this darkness we need to literally level everything that's going to be happening um or everything that has been happening sorry with this babylonian system it, it, it needs to just be burnt to ash and, it, and the only way to do that is God is going to come and he's going to shake things up and we're going to know it's God. We, there's, there's going to be no doubt about it. We will know it's God. And from that, the last harvest will come in the billion soul harvest. Here's, here's another pro that I forgot to mention, sorry, about uh, these last days. <clears throat> is that it seems missionary work. There was a lot of planting. A lot of planting going on with missionary work. I got to go here and I got to tell the world about Christ. And, you know, I'm going to tell this country. I'm going to go here. And there's a lot of planting going on. Last harvest, I don't think it's going to be planting so much as it's going to be harvesting. We will not have to go to them. They will come to us. We need to be prepared for that because we're talking about generational planting. All right. We're talking like years and years and years and decades and centuries of people planting certain things. And those plants are now growing up. And once once they're ripe, they're going to be due for the reaping. So it's not the stuff so much that we planted, but it could be stuff that maybe your grandfather did or maybe, you know, a, a distant relative asked for back in the day. And he hasn't seen the fruit of that coming. And now is the time for everything to be harvested. And when it happens, it's you, you won't have time to do like I'm going to go to India to talk to them about Christ. Now, India is going to come to you so that they can hear you talk to them about Christ. Like it's going to be that type of thing where the rules are flipped um, and it's they'll be kicking in your door to get all these answers. And it's like for me, that seems a lot cooler. I don't know why. I just I never like the idea of having to go to some place in the dirt and the heat. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm just I'm selfish that way. So. I still got a lot of flesh to work out, but at least I'm being honest. That's why I'm making these videos, to show you all my flaws, to show you the troubles I'm having, to show you all the pain and suffering that I'm going through, and just the thoughts that I'm having during this time, so that you who also have these problems can understand and know that you're not the only one who thinks this, and maybe I can give you some sort of inkling of a, a smidgen of an idea of how to overcome it, um, and move on to what God is calling you to do. Uh, but yeah, I, I see this as part of last harvest. There's going to be people who, uh, enemies, I don't want to say enemies. Well, I mean, they could be enemies, but people that just didn't believe you, didn't trust you, you know, God's not going to come through for you, mocked you on the internet, made jokes of you constantly. I think they're going to turn around during this time and they're going to come to you and apologize and just, and want to be part of this and want you to help them. So that's just, that's one example. Then there's also your neighbors. There's also people within your own congregation. There's family members, there's friends. It's going to be a flocking in of people just looking for an answer. And hopefully you will have the answer to give them because you're prepped and ready and prepared and part of the bride of Christ who is declaring and decreeing and fighting and engaged up in the spiritual warfare to show them how it's done. And also, before I forget, there's another slight topic that I need to jump on as well, too, which is pretty much uh, the quote of the day, um, the, the the Bible verse, and it's uh, Matthew 16, 18 through 19. And I say unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whosoever shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. I gotta close out that window a little bright there, sorry. Um Kat Kerr, uh another prophetess. <laughs> so, so is that how you say it? Is it a prophet or prophetess? I don't know. Some people say prophetess, some people say they're just prophets. I don't know. I, I didn't know that there was a gender fluidity to that name 
Anyways, she goes in and says uh, almost the opposite of what we think. You know, when you bind something, you constrict it, you bind it, you tie it, you shackle it up so it can't be moved. And when you loose it, you let it go and throw it out into the you know, into the atmosphere to spread it across the world. She thinks that's different. She thinks that when you loose something, you set it free and out of you um, as an expelling or a banishment. And when you bind something, you bring it in and you bind it to yourself. Um, and I've heard both sides of the scenario of what this verse means. I think it's both. I mean, why can't it be both? When you think about it, it technically means the same thing. It's just the verbiage. It's just the wording that you're using. And when you think about it, it, it could go both ways. You know, when you when you bind something, you're constricting, you're binding as in like banishment. You know, I bind you from doing this evil deed, you know, to, to those of evil. Or when you bind something to you, you're bringing and calling it down from heaven and binding it to your soul, to your spirit, to your nature. And when you let loose something, you're also spreading it out into the atmosphere, you know, and, and sending it across the planet as, say, like a holy blessing, as opposed to letting loose of those of the spiritual nature where it's like I'm, I'm casting you out. I'm, you know, you're banishing you. Um there's different ways to look at that, but I know one thing for sure is that we are supposed to be binding and loosening. And I know the Catholic thing of like, yes, he gave the keys unto Peter and therefore Peter is the first Pope. That's not what that means. Anyone can read and understand that he was speaking to Peter in regards to what Peter called him, which is Jesus the Christ. And he said, you know, blessed are you, Peter, because it wasn't you, but it was the Holy Spirit that gave you this information. Then he goes on to speak to all of them. You know, I mean, after he says, I will call you Peter, you know, and it is upon this rock, this foundation that I will build my church. Well, what is the church? What is the foundation of the church? The foundation of the church is that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. He's born the Virgin Mary, died and rose again on the third day and is now seated at the right hand of the Father. That's the foundation of the church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But we also need to be active in that calling. Whatever we bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever we loose on earth will be loose in heaven. We need to declare and decree this. This is the thing that I've been talking about with the kings and priests and who we are and the ambassadors of Christ and the spiritual warriors and the soldiers and the bride. We, we, we need to be all of this. We need to start acting as his helper, not just somebody that's woe is me and constantly praying and hoping that God intervenes. We need to listen to what he's calling us to do. We need to act upon this. We need to be the bride of Christ. We need to help Jesus. I'm not saying he doesn't, I'm not saying that he, he needs our help. Like, like, like if we don't do this, you know, God's, you know, impotent, you know, he can't do anything. I'm just saying, he wants us to be partakers in what he is doing. He wants us to be in agreement with what he is doing. He wants us to be helpers in what he is doing so that we can see who we are in Christ. And the, a lot of the churches is pushing that off. Maybe because they don't want to do it. Maybe because they don't see it. Maybe because they don't believe in it. I don't know. But I know that we need to start acting as the bride. I mean, could you imagine what would happen if the husband came home and, and just to give you a stupid chauvinistic, you know, toxic masculinity version of it is uh, if the man came home in the 1950s and saw the dishes not done and the dinner's not cooked and his slippers not out, and his pipe not set out. And, you know, and he's, <laughs> I mean, just like and the woman's just sitting there just smoking away. Yeah, what? You know, I mean, could, you know, does that sound like a helper to you? Could, could you imagine the 1950s show of the man you know, starting to unloosen his belt? What's going on? <laughs> Like I'm making a joke, you know, but it's like, that's, that's kind of where I see the church today where it's just like, all they do is ask, you know, give me five bucks. Give me, you know, I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to clean house. I'm not going to help you. I'm not going to be a partaker in this family relationship that we have in this unification of uh, marital spousal. I'm not going to do any of that stuff. You know, I'm going to tell people about you, but I'm not going to do anything about it. You know, oh, oh, we need to do this as a husband. I need you to do this. I need you to help me with this. I need you to, you know, I'm, I'm having a calling for you. There's, there's a certain responsibility that I'm calling you to do. And we're just like, yeah, whatever. Don't believe in it. You know, it's like, I'm, I'm not going to do it. That sounds stupid. You know, it's like, no, we, we need to start acting upon that. And I feel that if the church starts waking up into that, and again, I know there's different denominations. I know you guys all have your different different ideologies and different doctrines of faith apart from the fundamental of who Jesus is. Um, but we need to start accepting who other people are. We need to start seeing what they have, start maybe accepting what the 
Holy Spirit is calling you to do and to act upon it and to start partaking in what is going to be going down and get prepared and ready for it because it's time where the rubber meets the road. It's not fun being a path setter. For those of you who are out there, for those of you who have been in this cave season, for those who where the Lord pulled you away from your family, from your friends, from even your congregations, from everyone to set you in this time to get you ready. <clears throat> even Jesus went into the wilderness. The, the Holy Spirit compelled him to go off into the wilderness and be alone to fast, to pray, to be prepped for the ministry that was at hand for him. There's a lot of us that have been doing that. When Ezekiel came out and called fire down from heaven and did all sorts of just wild stuff, he came straight out of the wilderness. He was preparing for that time. The Lord, the Holy Spirit pulled him away for that time and prepped him. And when you heard of Ezekiel, this guy came from nowhere. He just, he just walked right out of the woods, right out of the wilderness and started doing his stuff. I think this is where we're going to be in the coming months during this darkened time. A lot of us have been called away We've been in our hibernation season, our cave dwelling season. We've been building up, trying to lean into the Lord. It's been a lot harder for me because I fight with him on a daily basis. I, I just, you have no idea. I've been trying to give all the pain and suffering that I have in my own life from the stories that you heard, you know, in previous episodes to the Lord, but it, it is a daily struggle. It's not a one and done for me. It's like every day I have to fight this. Every day I just, I, I have to try and trust with all my strength to believe in what God is going to be doing. Because again, I see all this, everything that I explained to you, I, I see the restoration. I see the full harvest coming in. I see the prosperity coming in. That it's just that one thing with the people I care about in my life that have, that have been pulled away from. I just, I just can't see it. And I, I wish I could trust the Lord. And I was on Elijah's streams the other day and I was talking with the person. He's like, what's the one thing, you know, that, that you, that you have trouble with the Lord and trying to focus in on that. And I'm like, the one thing, the one trouble that I have, the one thing that, that the Holy Spirit told me last is to trust him. And I knew exactly what it was. Trust him specifically with this particular trouble that I have. He's like, trust me. And I'm having still a very hard time trusting. I, I just, I, I wish I could trust, but it's just, I have been beaten down so insanely with this that I'm, I'm to the point of just giving up friendships. Like, like I said, and that they will catch up. And I don't mean friendships of what God's calling me to do. If he wants to call me and help people out, you know, or go to the, go to the church and help him with this, or, you know, if he has a calling, I'll do that. But close unity, close, like loving friendships, sincere friendships. I just don't want to do it anymore. I, I think the last one that I had just finally broke me. And I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm done. Whoever you send in my life to do your calling, I will do it, but I'm doing it apathetically. I all, all joy, all happiness, everything is gone for me. And I, I just, without those people back in my life, you know, even just, and I, for, for me, it's, it's not just of them being back in my life where I have to talk to them every day. It's just the acknowledgement that I exist, you know, like, Hey, happy birthday once would be nice. You know, it, that's, that's all I'm looking for. And, <clears throat> and even, even just that simple minute thing is, it's just, is the thing that just is pulling me away from God. And that's why I'm saying, this is why I could really use your prayers for that. Um, and even the Holy Spirit himself, you know, twice he said one, they will catch up. And then just recently within the past week or so, he's like, trust me on this, you know, and I'm still having trouble. But for all of you, whatever that situation is, whatever that situation, the, the, the problem that you're having where the Holy Spirit is saying, trust me on this. This is what we need to give to the Lord. Even if it has to be every single day, every single hour, you need to just give it to him and give it to him and give it to him so that we can finally hone in on what he's calling us to do so we can get this puppy moving and bring in this new kingdom age. And I think it's going to be beyond our wildest expectations. Again, everything that I mention right now is just, it's, it's just the tip of the iceberg. In fact, it might not even be the tip. It, it might not even be there at all. It, it may be just way, way, way beyond anything that I have mentioned so far. Like from what all the prophets say, it's going to be beyond anything you could possibly imagine. Just mind blowing insanity of joy. 
And again, I just need to get over that hump and understand that hopefully what I'm looking forward to will be part of that joy. Um, and I hope it will for you too. And I pray that it does because we need to start focusing. We need to get in gear. And I noticed that the Lord has been taking a lot from me. As you can see, um, <clears throat> apart from the throat, I'm not so slain in the spirit as much anymore. I'm not just, you know, constantly worn out and weary as I was when I started these videos. Um, so I knew I had a calling to do that. And as I progress, I'm starting to build up more and more. So hopefully by the time we get to the end of these videos, I'm ramped up and ready to go and energized. And you could see the progression of how I started. I, I would almost recommend that. <laughs> watch the last video when it finally comes and watch the first video or, you know, first couple of videos and just see the difference. Maybe that's what the Lord is trying to prepare me for, trying to show you guys. Maybe that's a thing that's a long drawn out progress. I don't know. Um, all I know is I'm called to do these videos and every Saturday I get up and I'm like, oh, I gotta do these videos. Oh, I don't want to do these videos. I don't want to talk. I'm tired. I just want to, I'm, I'm a man with the Peter Pan syndrome. I just want to sit and play video games all day. You know, it's <laughs> like, I just, I have, I have no, like, no will to do anything in my life anymore, but I know I got to keep progressing with these because I know they're slowly building me up and hopefully building you up as well and hopefully when this new kingdom age comes we will see the things that i've explained all the pros that are within the church will finally be unified into one all the joys that we see from all the different congregations and not just denominations in this world but all across the world just you know the way that people in africa worship and the way that people in south america and india and just you know russia and china and just their whole different styles all unified into one where there's no condemnation or there's no finger pointing or no, you're just idiots for doing it that way. We actually accept it and welcome it in and be like, this is great. This is awesome. I can't wait for this. I, I want to see more of this. What do you guys have? What do you do? That looks awesome. You know, and more praise and worship and glorification go up to the Lord because we're not so, we're not so boxed in. We're not so just like these four walls of what the church should be. And this is all that we do. And we don't touch anything else and stay away from us if you do. We need to get over that. We need to get way over that and start honing in on what the Lord is calling us to do and see the glory and just the expanse of all the different ways we can worship and glorify God and not take any sort of hindrance to it whatsoever. And I think that will be the binding, the coagulation of what the church should be and it'll explode from there. I hope it does and I'm sure it will. I just think that it's going to be even well beyond anything that I have mentioned in this video, and I'm just giving you a taste of it, but something tells me that God's up there laughing and going, you have no idea what's, <laughs> what's covered. Like, like, yeah, you got some good ideas there, but no, it's going to be way beyond that. So I'm looking forward to it. I'd rather not go through the dark season, uh, which I hear is going to be exponentially bad, probably couple months I and Diana Larkin says there's going to be a seven month period where we're going to be without food uh in the stores and stuff like that maybe even electricity and stuff so get get prepared start start prepping in any way that you can listen to the Lord listen to what he says trust in him don't just become a prepper and have like stocks you know like barrels of rice everywhere I mean just like listen to what he says because you probably won't even need it you might be able to use it to help others you know within your community or something but listen to what he's calling you to do Get prepared for it and then realize this is just the turning point for what is supposed to be coming, which is going to be exponentially better than anything we could have possibly dream. But we got to go through this start part first and we need to be prepared. We need to be awake and ready for when it does happen, because there's going to be a lot of people kicking down your door wondering what's going on. OK, so get right with God. Get all the pressures that you have off of you. And I know I'm being a hypocrite saying that because I really need to do that like exponentially, but keep passing it on to the Lord so that you can be prepared and ready for what's going to be coming. And I hope this has helped ever so mildly, if not a lot. And thank you, Lord, for this day, for helping me speak. I know, again, I was all over the place, but hopefully somebody got something in there somewhere. I'm looking forward to next week where I could speak again. <laughs> say that jokingly because uh, you know I'm exhausted every Saturday but hopefully you will give me the strength to just get through with it and make the video and put it up so that others can watch it and be prepared and ready for what is coming down and I give them I ask that you give them discernment and strength and wisdom courage and just the strength to carry on over the hump that they need to get over as well too and that you take it from them even though it may be hard for them to pass it on and that they in turn learn to trust you 
in what you are doing for that particular situation know that it'll be exponentially better than you could possibly imagine it's still a very tough one for me lord you know that but i am trying and for all of you out there i pray that you you get stronger with the lord and you turn to christ and i will catch you next week god bless bye now Hey all, me again. Uh, as I was mixing down this video, it's getting late at night. I did the clip early in the morning and now I'm doing this late at night because we had a birthday party to go to, so that was fun. Um, happy birthday to my friend's son, JT. He, uh, <laughs> it was it was interesting. Um, went over to his, uh, his grandfather's house, JT's grandfather's, on my friend Ben, his dad's house. So, really nice place. It was really cool. But uh, there's, there's something I forgot to do in my clip today. The lights are off and everything's down right now. But I forgot to give you um, the book of the day. And this one, <laughs> I, I kind of wanted to give it to you because it's, it's a little bit more lighter. It's a bit more fun book. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's it's not so serious, and um, it is a little hard to find. This is Arthur Maxwell, Your Bible and You. Now I'm going to zoom in on that because it is an old book, and I believe it's from the 50s. And it's kind of a coffee table sort of a picture book, but it's a uh, it's it's not really a how to, but I just found it a very nice sort of family fun read of the Bible. Um, you know, like how to get into this old way of life, uh, returning back to the fundamentals of our American heritage. And uh, it was in the 50s, so it does have a little bit of that sort of conformist 1950s like flair to it, but not so in depth that it's just, you know, uh, total McCarthyism, you know, like we're going to find communists in soup or anything like that. It's, but it is a, a fun, nice, subtle read and it's quaint and it does kind of take you back to a certain era where I feel just, it's, it's just more lax, more comfortable, more sort of kind of a happy feeling. <clears throat> Not that constant red scare McCarthyism is a, you know, happy feeling, but you get what I'm trying to say. It's just take, taking you back to a nicer time in American history where not everything was total Antifa BLM crazy and everything's on fire and people are killing one another and, you know, Biden's brain is pudding and it's just, you know, yeah, it, it's a good one. The, the person that I'm going to give today as a recommendation for videos, clips to watch is Wanda Elger. And Wanda Elger is kind of like me, except way better, <laughs> exponentially better at what she does. She's a fellow watchman on the wall. And out of all the people that I listen to, um, I, sh I shouldn't say I listen to her on a daily basis because she doesn't really do clips on a daily basis. But for all the people that I listen to that have clips and do videos and lectures and stuff like that, she's the one that I can relate to the most because she is just, she, her brain is almost just like in par with how I think and how I kind of ask questions and look for answers and the way that she deciphers stuff and explains things. And it's weird. I almost have kind of a call and response to her. Not that she's aware. I don't even think she watches his videos or even knows who I am. But the call and response more is to me where I have an issue or my, my wife and I might get into an argument on a certain theological debate on what's going down these days, what's happening in the world. And we have these questions and why is this happening? Or, you know, like, fill in the blank with this question. And it's like, I, I don't know, maybe it's because of this. And literally the next day when I get up, Wanda Elger has a, a post, a video about that very exact thing that I was having trouble with the night before. It was almost kind of like going back to that fortune cookie um, thing I, I, was, I was mentioning in my introduction where the Lord speaks to me through fortune cookies, which I thought was funny. And I just had more backing on that too, watching Elijah's streams of another couple where they get weird messages from all sorts of weird things like license plates and stuff. Like they'd ask a question and a car would pull, pull in front of them and like give them the answer in a, a, a license plate, just the weirdest stuff. So I don't feel so bad about the fortune cookie now, but 
Wanda Elger is like that too. Like she, she, not to say that she's my fortune cookie or anything, but I just find it interesting that when I have an issue or when I have something on my mind and it's a kind of a pressing matter that she always seems to have an answer the next day for me or sometimes that day. So I found that a little funny and being a fellow watchman on the wall and thank you Wanda for all that you do. And I highly recommend her. Um, if you like my videos, hers will blow you away. There's, I'm not even like, I'm not even remotely close. To what she does it's really good stuff so i'll put those two down if you can find that book <laughs> that your bible and you get it um it might be a little hard to find but it's worth it um yeah uh nice fun for the whole family just to sit down and read and it's quaint and comfortable and it kind of makes you feel cozy inside and wanda elger uh kicks it up a notch compared to what i do with these videos and highly recommend her as well so Apart from that, uh, sorry this came after the closing. Uh, again, I, I forgot there was so much I wanted to pack in today. And still, just like with the few past videos, I haven't been able to get everything in. It's been just like trying to shoehorn and cram everything in, and it just hasn't. But I hope this video helped you out. I hope I haven't offended uh, the wrong people, and I hope I've offended the right people <laughs> since you can get with God, but those who are uh, fellow members within the body of Christ, within the church, just know that the things I said today is not supposed to harm you. It's supposed to let you know that, you know, there's, there is a personal relationship you have with God. And um, there's also a personal relationship I have with other people. And there's also a personal relationship I have with the church. And sometimes those don't all intermix in the way that the church may think is fitting for themselves. Um, as a replacement for Christ or a replacement for those in a personal relationship to those who I care about. And it's not supposed to be insulting. It's just to let you know that as the body, we are here to help each other. We're here to love each other. We're here just to support each other. We're here to be in addition to each other with other family members and friends and everyone else we care about, including Christ. But it's not in place of Christ. Just remember that. He is the reason for your being, and he is your first love. Everyone else is your second love, including the other fellow body of Christ, all right? Or the bride of Christ is what I should say, sorry. So he's, he's your first. Put him first always, and the rest will be added unto you. Just remember that. So, All right, I will catch you all later. Take care and God bless.